Hoop Dreams, the podcast, an Unlearning Network production. The man joining us today was a standout at Nicolette High School in Wisconsin, where the Badgers play, where the Warriors play, the Golden <laughs> Eagles play where he was named conference MVP and first team All-State in his senior year. He went on to play at Stanford University, where he was named first team All-Pac-10, and he was also selected, here it is, Pac-10 academic first team. He went on to play professionally in Germany, Spain, Romania, and Israel. We are happy to have former ball player, current technology executive, and get this, he's writing books. Dan Grunfield on the Hoop Dreams Podcast. I'm Will Gates, and that's my dog. Arthur A.G. Thanks, Dan, for coming on, man. We really appreciate this, man. Oh, it's great to be here, guys. Dan, well, I'm just going to jump into this thing, man. Do you remember the first time you watched Hoop Dreams? Where were you, and who were you with? Of course. I remember the first time and the last time I I watched it, and we'll get to both of them. (laughs) Uh, the first time, so I didn't see it in a theater, but I had it on VHS and I watched it with my dad, you know, my dad played basketball. And so we watched it together, man. And, you know, it's about three hours and it flew by, you know, when you, when you're a young kid, I I was 10 years old when it came out. Right. So three hour movie, your parents wonder, oh, is he going to be able to, you know, is it going to be too long? Is he going to sit through, man? Uh It it flew by one of my favorites when I was a kid and, you know, I knew we were going to be chatting. So I asked my wife. Two weeks ago, I said, have you ever seen Hoop Dreams? And she said, no. I said, well, that changes tonight. And so we (laughs) sat, and and I'm serious, Saturday night, I said, hey, get the popcorn, here we go. And we watched it two weeks ago, and the same thing, we started the movie a little late, and so she said, oh, I might have to go to sleep. Man, she wasn't going anywhere, guys. We talked about it. (laughs) After it was over, we talked about it for an hour. We were, you know, going over it also, dude. She was, I mean, listen, man. I'm such huge fans of you both. You know that. I mean, it, it's a masterpiece, man. It's a masterpiece. So the movie means so much to me and basketball players all over the world. Hey, hey Dan, going forward in your in when you when you start developing the game and and start you know loving the game, did it have an impact on you going forward? Always, man, because you carry with you the stories that you know about the game, you know, and how it impacts people's lives and what you what you both went through you know, you take that with you. And so, and I had a bad knee injury in college. You know, I tore Mm. my ACL at a really tough time. And so Will, like I had seen what you went through, right. With your knee. And so you just kind of, you take that story with you, man. And so you both know like this, your, your movie, of course, touched me in my life, but, but really basketball uh, players all over the world, man. Man, we appreciate that, man. Much love right there. And what's, what's your wife's name? Sam. Shout out to Sam, staying up and handling them three hours. Yeah. Sam what, Sam knows I'm talking to you. She said, tell these guys I say what's up. Like She's like, I'm starstruck <laughs> just knowing that you're talking to them. Oh. <laughs> you know, she, man, she she loved the movie, man. She loved it. Big ups to Queen, Mrs. That. Grunfield. Yes. That's right. Yep. That's right. The Queen. <laughs> now, we understand, right. man, you got a very important book coming out about your family called by the grace of the game. First of all, when it comes out, you know we need copies signed autographs. Always. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. So, but we're going to talk about that. But first, AJ and I, man, our podcast is a little bit different. We want to know the Dan Grunfield origin story. So take us back to your childhood. You were born in Franklin Lake, New Jersey. You lived there until you were in m- middle school. What kind of town was it? De- describe that early part of your childhood growing up. Absolutely, man. So I grew up in a really nice town outside of New York City, you know, so when I was born, my dad was a player for the Knicks, you know, and so my birth was scheduled around his NBA basketball schedule, you know, so like, I (laughs) I came into the world like around the NBA, you know, so I mean, listen, I, I, I was privileged in a lot of ways growing up and I had, you know, I had access to my dad's teams. And so I was always in gyms, always, you know, going to games and just, you know, when you when you come up and your dad's a player, that's all you want to be, you know? So yeah. I was always in our driveway, practicing, shooting hoops, going to the Knicks practice facility, you know? So mm-hmm. uh, it was it was just always something that I knew that I wanted to do. But I'll say that my dad was awesome because he never forced it on me, you know, because he knew he was a great player, right? So he wanted me to know, hey, man, what whatever you want to do, you do. 
if you want to go into theater, if you want to go into arts, whatever it is, you do what you want to do. But I just wanted to play basketball. That's pretty awesome, man. So how many, I mean, how many brothers and sisters you should have? One older sister. And so, you know, she, we're super close. She's still like my best friend. And we joke because she didn't, she didn't play basketball like I did, but because we grew up in like an NBA family, man, she knows the game front and back. Right. So we would, we would watch the, oh man, we would watch the Knicks and she would talk about, you know, the post feed to Ewing and why he didn't have the good, you know, his legs under him on his turnaround. Like she, she knows the game, but she didn't play it, you know, in the way that I did, but she was like, right. man, my not only my best friend, but biggest supporter, came to all my games, always cheering me on. And listen, man, in my house, like, that's what you did. You know, we, we talked about basketball. We watched basketball. Well, obviously, awesome. you, you, you have to. I mean, with your basketball family, it kind of reminds me of me and my boys. Even to this yep. very day, <laughs> we're having uh, arguments about who's the greatest, who's not the greatest. But you mentioned, then that, you know, basketball runs deep in your family, your yeah. dad. As you said, a great NBA player, Bucks, the Kings, the Knicks, executive and GM for the Knicks and the Bucks. Mm-hmm. Did you play other sports growing up outside of basketball, or was that your love only? It's funny that you say that because my mom will be like, "Oh, he was a pretty good baseball player," and my dad will be like, "What were you watching?" You know, <laughs> my, you, know <laughs> you know how moms are. You know, they think so get like, out of here. I, Listen, I played baseball, you know, but uh, I I had a one track mind, you know, but again, like my parents were super cool and they just exposed me to everything. But I'll tell you. So and I also played soccer growing up and I still remember in sixth grade, I was enrolled in soccer and we went I went to my first practice and and Mm -hmm. someone kicked the ball to me in front of the goal and I caught it and I went to like in a shooting position like I was going (laughs) to shoot it like a basketball. And I said, I do. I swear to you, I never went back. I said, <laughs> you know, I, I'm only thinking about one thing. I caught the ball like in a triple threat. You know, it's like, dude, you can't use your hands in soccer, man. So uh, that, that was my last experience. Hey, I wonder what the, I wonder what went through your coach head. Like he was like, get him out, get him, get him on the basketball court. <laughs> right, that's right, all. That's right, all he has on right, his mind. <laughs> right. For you to even make that gesture as to pick it up, you know, with your hands and go into a three point position, coach been like. He thinking about basketball. Get him out of here. That's exactly what it was, man. That's all I had on my mind. And so, yeah, from sixth grade on, you know, I was just, I was just playing hoops. So, listen, growing up in New Jersey, y'all, I mean, y'all, wh- wh- where did you, did you play the game on the outdoors, like on the playgrounds and stuff? And if so, where? So I didn't, we didn't have like parks in my town or playgrounds or anything like that where I could play five on five. I had a hoop in my driveway. You know, so I would always be what? on my driveway playing. Kids from the neighborhood come over. But, you know, I was playing on several traveling teams. So I did the majority mm. of my five on five in a gym. But I was always in the driveway playing, you know, which is different because my dad, after he came to America, he grew up in Queens, New York. He learned basketball at the park. Mm-hmm. At the it park, was all yeah. outdoor, you know. And so, <laughs> you know, I grew up not far from where he grew up, about, you know, 45 minutes of an hour. So whenever we were in the neighborhood, we would drive by. You know, and he would point Mm. to the park and he would point to the different places. You know, I grew up in a little bit of, you know, in northern New Jersey where there weren't really parks like that. So, you know, while I played on my blacktop, a lot of stuff was done in gym. You know, we had a couple of guys on uh, on teams I played with at Marquette kind of grew up similar with the with the with the hoop on the garage. So our head coach used to always say, man, you shouldn't Mitch. All you did was went outside and shot (laughs) every day. That's yeah. How do you miss? <laughs> that's right. You had so so much access to a hoop, you better not miss it. That's right. That's right. So, man, AJ and I, you know, we're from Chicago. And as you even hear him, I call him AG. Yep. Tuss. Uh, they call me Thrill. Um, every guy has nicknames. We earn those nicknames. What was your nickname? How did you earn it? <laughs> yeah, I, I, wish, I wish I had one of those as cool as yours. Uh, People used to do variations of my name, right? So my name's Dan Grunfeld. So people really call me DG, right? Which are my initials, you know, or Danny G or things like that. I did have someone in college, when I was playing at Stanford, Some one fan started calling me Flash. Don't ask me why, because if you ever saw me play, there was no flashes, right? It was, a, <laughs> it was a little, you know, I wasn't the quickest guy on the court. Uh, but I remember someone, you know, when I was playing really well, one of my friends said, hey, you know, they're calling you Flash. I said, man, I got to learn why. And I never did learn why. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but usually, like, when it came to basketball, people call me DG. So you're saying you didn't have none of that Dwayne Wade speed? Not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. 
uh, I, I actually, you know, I played pickup with Dwayne one time in Milwaukee, you know, when he was at Marquette, man. And, uh, oh, we went, I told people, I was like, you, you have no idea. Like, like <laughs> it was, it was on it. You know, sometimes you, and you got both know you play against someone or you see someone. And I felt that way about LeBron too, because I played against him when he was in high school. And I, I was telling my friends, you don't know, like, like you don't know what you're about to see in a few <laughs> years. So Dwayne Wade was that way too. Do you think it's difficult to actually explain that to people that when you, because a lot of times people, you're right, they don't know. But how how can you explain that? Because even even as athletes, we come across a guy like, you know, the first time I came across Shaquille O'Neal, I was like, man, you really that big, aren't you? You know, it's like you a massive human being. <laughs> you know what it is like? And we all know because we, we played when you play the game. And then you see someone like LeBron, it's like you've been seeing in black and white and now you see in color. Like it's just, it's a whole, di even when you play and you play at the highest level, you see mm -hmm. someone who was so obviously born to do this, you know? And I, yeah. I, I literally, like he was a sophomore in high school and I was telling, I called my dad, I was like, dad, I just saw, something. I just saw a player that I can't even understand, man. It was, yeah. So it's hard to, it's hard to put into words when you see someone who's that great. So Dan, you playing AAU uh, basketball and then, I mean, you around the time where AAU was at its height. Give us that difference of when you started playing AAU basketball versus playing for your high school team. Without a doubt, man. So I, I, I played on a great AAU team out of Milwaukee. Uh, you know, George Carl's program, Friends of Hoop, and they have a team in Seattle as well. We had a really strong team, good organization. And I, I was telling Will, like, the basketball in Milwaukee it is top-notch. And certainly when I was there in high school, man, we had several players from Milwaukee who played in the NBA my year, several more who, like myself who played high level internationally and at big time colleges. And so it was competitive, man. And so I played on a very good high school team. I had someone on my team who was a year older than me, played at uh, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, led them to the Sweet 16, was a pro himself. And so good high school team, but AAU was a whole different deal, man. And, you know, we were going to LA and we were going to Chicago and we were traveling around the country. And that's when I played against the guys like the LeBrons and the Carmelos where you really have to cut your teeth, you know? And so it, it it opens up your mind because you're like, man, there's there's someone in every city in America doing what you're doing, you know, working as hard as they can to make it. And then, you know, the ball rolls out. It's made the best man win. And, you know, so there were a lot, a lot of battles, man. But it was it's where where I cut my teeth and really you know measured up and said, hey, how good are you? When you come off the AAU circuit, did you feel some type of confidence level boosting? Big time, man. And so. I was a little bit of a late bloomer. So I was a good player my junior year. I was all I was first team all conference in high school, but I had like 17 points a game. I was being recruited by mid-major colleges. And then when we, you know, going into your senior year, that's really, you know, that summer is when you, you know, when you really have the time to, you know, get recruited and, and, and do what you need to do. And I, I blew up, man. I had 45 points in the first game of the biggest tournament of the summer, you know, and I did really well at what? ABCD camp, which was, yeah, man, like, because I wanted to go to Stanford and they were recruiting me. And it was getting down to the wire and they hadn't offered me yet. And in the first game of like the Adidas big time tournament, that's like the big one in Vegas, I had 45. And so after what? that, I was like, oh, I'm good. I'm going to Stanford. 45 no. DG. Come on, man. Guys, for, hey, listen. And, and it's funny because you all know, like as a scorer, I, I always knew how many points I had. Not that I'm keeping track, but you just know. Like I just, yeah. and this game, I also wasn't the type of guy who did a lot off the dribble. I kind of like off the move i shot it i slashed i got it off the glass I, I did a lot of different things but i didn't really shoot off the dribble and this game the first time i touched it boom off the dribble jumper and i made it and i and then what? my mind just kind of went blank and we were playing and then the game and i was i knew i was scoring a lot but i just was going through it and at the end of the game 45 and i was like oh my gosh like you know sometimes things just happen at the time that it's supposed to happen in your life man mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. I, I needed that game because i really wanted to go to stanford and I got it. And then, you know, I got offered a scholarship, you know, days later and accepted. And, you know, the rest is history. Was that the moment Dang. for you, though? At that point in my life, it was. Thankfully, I had other great moments, you know, when my career kind of built. But, man, like, and this kind of gets into my whole family story. My grandmother lives out in the Bay Area. So I really wanted to go to Stanford. So, like, that meant the world to me. So, like, that was my mission, man. I was like, get to Stanford. And I knew I was close. And, you know, that was a top program at the time. And so it, it meant a lot to try to get that done. And, yeah, man, having 45 like I did. And by the way, I had 30 the next game, guys. So I don't want it to be a flash in the pan, okay? <laughs> guys. Okay, guys. T, okay. <laughs> like, this ain't no fluke now. I had 30 the next game. But I'll also tell you that the la one of the last games of the tournament, we were playing the team who ended up finishing second out of like 400 teams. And we were down three. 
and my coach drew up a play for me and it worked and I had a, a look with one second left to tie the game and I dribbled it and I dribbled it off my foot oh. and it went out of bounds. And so it just shows you, I averaged over 27 a game for the tournament, right? So I was, you know, I had an unbelievable time, but you know, you're a hero one day and you're, you know, and then I yeah. messed it up the next day. So I kind of like, it, it really taught me like, keep it all in perspective, man. Cause you're going to be on top one day. The next day you're going to be dribbling off your foot with every coach of the country there. But wow. after I dribbled off my foot, Stanford still called and offered me, man. So, you know, it was all good. But <laughs> it just shows out. you so, the different things that happen, you know, when you have a career. Still worked out. I love it. I just wanted to get your take on AAU as a whole because, you know, it's it's some love it, some hate it. Um, obviously, you know, you were successful at it. But what are your thoughts on just the AAU system as a whole? Yeah, and I'll tell you, this is from when I played, right? So this was this was the early 2000s. I really benefited because I was part of a really good program with an excellent coach. You know, so it was really team oriented. You know, and I, I played on multiple teams as we all did. You know, you're always kind of playing around. And I mm -hmm. was in some situations which weren't as good for me, which there wasn't as much structure. You know, so I think that ultimately, when when kids have an opportunity to play the game, to get to know other people, to cooperate, it's a good thing. I just know that for me, when I was in situations where there was a lot of structure, when the coaching was really high quality, it helped me more, you know, because sometimes, mm. you know, the AAU scene, you know, some people can get lost to the shuffle, you know, and not everyone maybe gets the, the opportunity you hope they would. But, you know, at any time for me where a young player can get opportunities to show what they can do in an environment that's good for them, I'm for it, you know, because because kids need opportunities to play. That's 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 pretty much what I like about it is, you know, you could take some kids that, you know, that's, you know, that's in a rough area. But if they if they know they would a, a great, like you said, a great program and a great coach, you know, similar to the mean streets here and the Mac Irvin fire here in Chicago, you know, they, they have a they have structure, but it's, it's mm -hmm. very competitive. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Like all kids can't play for those two teams. But, you know, I'm, I'm glad that it does get them out of Chicago, you know, off the streets, hanging with their buddies, playing video games. Yeah. Something that's, you know, it's I, I like it for that aspect. When the kids say, man, I, I went down to Florida. That's my first time going down there with my team and, you know, never been out of the out of the out of the city. I love to hear stuff like that. Yeah, it's great. And like I still am, am friends with the guys I played with. You know, we still send messages on Facebook or keep up with each other and yeah, like you said, the camaraderie you build, the experiences you have, like it, it can be a pretty special thing. And also, like you said, on a competitive side, when you come from a city, you're the best player in your high school or maybe in your county, but it keeps getting, you know, getting wider and wider. Right. And so you you really kind of find out what's what when you get the best players together playing against other best players. You know, it's right. yeah, it's it's competitive, man. And uh, but no, I I had an awesome experience with it. So Dan, drop us some names of who you who you getting these 45 zone like in the in the in the AAU tournament give us some names so someone asked me the other day like was this a good team not that I talked about it that <laughs> much but I happened to mention it you know <laughs> they wanted to kind of check me like okay who are you playing against right. I will say that the, that particular game the team we played was from Washington State and they had two guys who who started at Gonzaga uh and another guy who started for Santa Clara so it was you know it, it was a good team and you know what it is guys like Listen, and I just said it like I, both of you too. You've dominated games. You sucked it up in games, right? That's mm -hmm. being an athlete. That's what's being a player. But when you're killing, you're killing. You know, and some when you have it, sometimes you just have it going, and it doesn't. You know, like those rare moments yeah. when you just have it going. It's not like it doesn't matter who you're playing against, but sometimes when you have it going, uh, it's just one of those special moments. So uh, that that was that for me. So now you are transitioning. Dad is with the Bucks. You 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 you. Had in high school, so when your dad moved to Milwaukee for work, I just got to ask, did your allegiance change or are you still a Knicks fan? My allegiance changed instantly, man, because, you know, <laughs> the way I looked at it is whatever team my dad is with, that's my team, you know? So when I was born and growing up, my dad was with the Knicks. I always loved the Knicks, but as soon as he left and went to Milwaukee, I'm a Milwaukee Bucks fan. Wow. Now, how old were you when you, when you all moved out that way? We were, I was a sophomore in high school. So I was mm. 15, you know, which is, it's a tough time to move, but my parents met in Milwaukee. That's where my dad played for the Bucks. My mom's from Milwaukee. Okay. So I, I, my grandparents lived there. I had some familiarity with, with the place. So it wasn't, 
it wasn't just totally random, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, it, listen, like the Bucks at the time, if you remember, Ray Allen, Glenn Robinson, Sam Cassell, Tim Thomas, you know, these were great teams. And so, and I was kind of an up and coming player, so I could work out with those guys a little bit, play with, play, pick up with them once in a while. And so I, I was all in, man. And those Bucks teams, I mean, you know, they went to the game seven of the Eastern Conference Finals in, in 2001. Like, I, I was loving it. I, I love Milwaukee. Man, 15 years old, moving from Jersey to Milwaukee. What Speak to that adjustment as a 15-year-old kid. I know you got tons of things going through your head, like, damn, like, what high school I'm enrolling to? Am I going to have to go on here and prove myself and try to make the team? Like, walk us through that. Yeah, it's hard. You know how it is. And, of course, I I, I watched you two grow up, you know, and, Arthur, you know, you switch high schools back for, like, I, you yep. know, you know how it is when you when you switch schools. And so, yeah. I didn't know exactly what to expect, but I just knew that I wanted to, you know, play basketball like anyone else, make friends, meet people, mm-hmm. you know, kind of build a new life. And it's hard when you leave your friends behind and, and go elsewhere. But I was really lucky that like this community embraced me. Uh, I went mm. to a great public high school that had a really good team, you know, so it it was a, an easier transition than it, it might have otherwise been. But on a personal level, it's hard because, you know, you're 15, you know how it is when you're 15 years old. You're yep. coming into your own, you're, you know, and so yep. you have to just kind of kind of rebuild. And I can vividly remember the first few weeks there, like I would just sit alone in the room like I don't know anyone. You know, I'm, I'm trying right. to like, you know, because you don't have any friends. And so it, it's just yep. that's an adjustment. But and, and you know, I, I've seen it from your movie and with you two guys like basketball brings people together. You know, yep. so I started playing in the pickup games. I actually one of my one of my teammates, the other the other guy who played professionally, he took me to his park in his neighborhood and we played together and it's like, okay, mm. they're like, Oh, he can play. He likes the game. Now all of a sudden I have a circle. So, you know, you, you both know like basketball brought you together. Basketball brought me together with all my friends. And so that really was, you know, such a big part of helping me, you know, get acclimated. Now who settled on the high school that you went to? Was it other schools that you could have went to or was it, it was like, it was it, the school is close to where you live. So you're going to go there. I looked around a bit, you know, ultimately, like my, my parents, my mom in particular, like had an idea of where, the, where they were going to live, you know, so that, that was, you know, that was a big part of it. But um, I, I looked at other high schools, uh, Marquette University High School being one of them, Will, because uh, they, have, they have a nice high school there with a good basketball program. But the, the school I ended up going to, Nicolet, is one of the, is the, I think it's the best public high school in the state. It's a really good high school um, and, mm. and they have a good, good basketball team. And so, you know, I was, I really got along well with the coach who's still a good friend of mine to this day. And uh, yeah, man, it was, you know, I, I was, you know, growing up in New Jersey, if you were told, oh, you're going to move to Milwaukee, I would have said, oh, the basketball in Milwaukee can't be that good. But I was sorely mistaken, man. If I, <laughs> if I wouldn't have moved to Milwaukee, I would have never gone to Stanford. Never. Wow. Wow. Yep. wow. Yeah. Nicola is very tough high school. Even when I was up there, we used to, and of course, like you said, Marquette University High School. Uh, actually, it's down the street. A lot of people don't know this, but it's actually down the street from Marquette University itself. Right. Uh, but you, but you're in school, and I just gotta ask you this: We gonna call you your nickname, DG. I gotta ask Please. you this: Did did folks know who your dad was? Did did that help with the transition? You know, they definitely knew who he was because he had just been hired to be the GM of the Bucks, and he had played for the Bucks, so. I think it, it helps because it gives you a kind of like a talking point, you know, like there's, it's not like there's nothing to talk to. It's like, Oh, you know, he's a basketball guy. His dad works for the Bucks, So it, it helps in that way. But, you know, and I grew up in a, in a situation where my dad was kind of in the public eye, you know? So I was used to people and my parents always told me like, just to be aware of kind of why people want to be your friend or talking to you, you know? So it may, and I'll tell you, man, the people in Milwaukee are such good people. I really felt from the beginning, they just wanted to get to know me from me. You know, which yeah. and I could feel that, and I really appreciated that. And you know how it is, like, and you too, like, with hoop dreams, like you're you have celebrity all over the world. People know who you are, and you could probably tell, like, when people just want to know you because you're the guy from Hoop Dreams, or no, they care about who you are as people, and they care, you know. And so there, there's mm-hmm. a difference there, mm-hmm. and I, I felt that in Milwaukee, man, that people just like were with me as as a dude, and so uh, I, I really just appreciated that, and and I, you know, kind of integrated into the community very quick because of that. So how many times did you get asked for tickets? That's what I was just about to ask him, Will. Like, <laughs> now, was you out there scalping your dad's tickets? <laughs> yeah, I don't have enough fingers. No. Uh, pe- <laughs> yeah. Pe- people people were cool. I think people understood, like, but don't get me wrong. It happened, right? People, it happened. But 
but most of the time people were respectful and, and understood like, Hey, like I, you know, that's probably not something I could do for everyone, you know, but I did try to like take friends and people to games with me and stuff. Cause listen, it's fun. It's cool. Like, it's great to be, especially then the, the, you know, Bradley center at the time was rocking. Like it's great to be downtown watching basketball games. So I tried to, you know, bring friends along so we could all enjoy that. It's easy. All you have to do is go to mybookie.ag, sign up and use our promo code hoop dreams. And my bookie will double your first deposit instantly up to a thousand dollars. How's that for fast money? So man, you had Nicolette high school when you got there, you know, you talked a little bit about, you know, the adjustment there, but let's talk about the, the team were they any good when you first got there we were good uh, so my teammate joe tucker who was a you know excellent college player at uh, wisconsin milwaukee and then played professionally he was a conference player of the year as a sophomore so i came wow. as a sophomore he was a junior i mean he was joe was a monster man he was a hell of a player and uh and so yeah it, it was a good team it was a good team i mean he was six six we had a six five really athletic four you know i i did start as a sophomore at shooting guard i was 6'2 you know so i was 6'2 165 pounds you know by the time i graduated as a senior i was like 6'6 210 pounds you know so damn I, but i'll tell you to my coach's credit my senior year in high school i played shooting guard so i was six foot six you know i was the i think i was the tallest guy we had another six foot six guy but i was a shooting guard and i actually played back a point when our point guard went out because i was a mm. you know i always grew up playing with older kids right so I was a guard, you know, I was just a guard. But as I grew, grew mm -hmm. old, got older, got bigger, hey man, six foot six, two guard, that's the type of size you need to play at the yes. next level, you know? So yes. I, uh, you know, you know how it is, like sometimes coaches, when they have a big kid, they'll just put them on the block or her on the block, you know? And then, you know, it, it kind of limits the skill development. So I was lucky to play for coaches who didn't do that to me. Mm, absolutely. Man, you had, you had Nicolette putting up average of 23, seven rebounds, shot 61% from the floor, Conference MVP, all league first team, first team all area, first team all state. What the what the hell got into you, <laughs> DG? Listen, man, I, I found my rhythm my senior year, and and I and what I meant as I mentioned, like I had that great summer, you know. And, and to your question, Will, like my confidence was really high, my game had come along. You know what's funny though? My senior year, I averaged twenty three nine, and I wish it would have been twenty four zero, so people would say twenty four, not twenty three. Uh, but that's you know, <laughs> you know how it is, it's like, man. Yeah. That wasn't 23. It was 23.9. It might as well have been a fraction yeah. of a point. Can we just call it 24 and move on yeah, from it? 24, but, uh, man. Yeah, listen, I, I was, uh, I, you know, again, I had the size. My game had really come along. So I was I was a dominant player in high school. And, you know, it's what you, and you both know how it is. And it's cool because I saw your high school careers and you both, you know, yeah. found your rhythms at different times and had your successes like growing up when you're like fifth, sixth, seventh grade, even before that. That's what you dream of doing. Right. You dream of like mm -hmm. taking the court yeah. with people watching and being someone where people say, oh, like, you know, I like his game or he's good or she's good. So like for that to happen in high school, like that was almost a dream come true. Right now, as I look back yeah. on it, like I played in college, I played professionally so that, you know, playing in high school kind of it, right. it, it fits in a different context. But at the time, taking the floor and being one of the best players in the state and people knowing who I am and college coaches sitting in the bleachers like. That's what I always wanted, you know? So, and you both know, like, you've been through it. So, like, it was it was awesome. A, B, C, D, camp. Yep. Man, what was that like? Because I remember my experience, and I remember the guys who was there, like Chris Webber, Jalen Rose, Daniel Marshall, you know. Who was there with you? So, I'll tell you, I remember the first night of camp, you know, we're sitting there, everyone's, like, you know, measuring each other, checking each other out, and they were they called out the teams and so you know you're just hearing names read off and i hear dan grunfeld so i'm my ears are perked up i'm like okay another name another name then i hear carmelo anthony and i said okay i heard of him i, I like he like i know he's good and then we had a practice you know and i went into the lane and i shot a little floater which like in milwaukee i was getting that off every day of the week here comes carmelo <laughs> <laughs> i didn't know he would get at that one you know but uh Dude, so Carmelo was on my team. He he left camp a little early, so he only played one actual game with us. But you could tell right away. I was like, okay, this is this is a different level here. And mm. um, you know, and, and LeBron, you know, LeBron was in camp, and we played LeBron's team, and, and it, it was it was just absolutely unbelievable to watch this guy play. Uh, wow. you know, I think, yeah, it was it was just a whole different level with him. And you know, there was there were several other NBA players on my team as well, not all star players, but you know, just like everywhere you looked at this, 
camp, if you go back at the rosters, there's NBA players, you know, because it's the best high school players in the country, you know. So right. it was and it was where you measured up. And, you know, it, it was it was fun because it was in New Jersey, northern New Jersey. And that's where I grew up. So a bunch right. of my friends were coming to watch. And I'll actually tell you both a story. My so my best friends came to watch. And it was it was after one of my games. And I said, hey, we have to go watch this guy, LeBron James. I was like, trust me. They never heard of him. I go, trust me. And so we went to the court. And it was a timeout. And then they came back from the timeout. I go, hey, there he is. As soon as the, he's on defense, right? As soon as the ball comes in, they pass it to the wing. He intercepts the pass. So now he's on a break. And, and the defender's trying to get him. And I kind of am, am nudging my friend. I'm like, watch this. Watch this. This is the guy. <laughs> LeBron, behind the back pass to a guy that's coming, that's trailing him. So I'm, I'm really nudging my friend. I'm like, oh, steals the ball behind the back pass. The guy misses the layup. LeBron jumps, catches it backwards, dunks it back in. I said to my friend, I told you. <laughs> what? <laughs> so what did I tell you? It took, it took 15 seconds. I said, we don't have to watch anymore. I told you. <laughs> Damn. That was, that was LeBron. <laughs> was You know, man, it's just some dudes you see for the first time and you just be like, yep. He's cut from a different cloth. He his body, That's it. the way he runs, the move, he got NBA written all over it. And and it's it, the NBA could be like four or five years from now, you know, for this for this yep. kid. But you could just see it, like, damn. Yep, yep. So it was it was great, and you know, I I played well. You know, I played pretty well because I was still trying to prove myself at the time and. You know, so mm -hmm. I had a good camp and it kind of continued to propel me. And I, again, I wanted to go to Stanford and they were there watching me and I did fairly well. And so, you know, listen, it's, it, you said the origin story, the part of the journey, like I remember, like it was yesterday, man. I remember my, my AU teammates, mom picking us up in the morning to go to the airport and we had to leave at like 4 a.m. And I remember walking out of the door saying, Hey, man, no, don't complain about how early it is because camp starts right now. Wow. Like, if you want to do this, like, you're going to do it now. So I remember I got in the car. I said, let's roll. Like, it's time, you know? And so, yeah. but I was like 17 years old and I'm 37 now. It's 20 years ago. I can still remember that morning walking out to that car. Like, like, don't be complaining. <laughs> like, you're ready. You got to be ready, you know? So I can imagine, man, you was a great teammate. You at the top camps, man, you killing in high school. Stanford. What mm -hmm. was it about Stanford? Yeah, man. So, so it's interesting. So, so my grandmother lives out here. So I live in the Bay Area now, and she lives about 25 minutes away from Stanford's campus. My older sister, who I talked about, when, she's, when she was looking at colleges, we came out here, out to the Bay Area to visit my grandma and to look at colleges. So we stopped by Stanford's campus. And I was in like seventh grade. They were a top five team in the country, great academics, and I was a good student. And But I was living in New Jersey at the time. And I didn't see, I didn't hear about Stanford. It was a different day and age. It wasn't the internet like that. So I right. didn't really know much about Stanford. I said, wait a second, sunny all the time, great basketball, great academics right down the street from my grandma. And I'm, I'm like that as a person. I'm, I'm kind of disciplined, motivated. So when I see something I want, I go for it, you know? And so I said, yep. then I'm, I'm going here. And people laughed at me, man, because, you know, like what Archer said, like, I was no superstar at basketball. I was a good player growing up, but I wasn't, you know, not like you will, who had like all the fanfare as a young, like. I didn't have that. So the thought of playing at a, at a program like Stanford was crazy, but I just, my mind was set on it, man. And, and as I got older and I got bigger and I got better and then they started recruiting me and I was, you know, I just kept, kept at it. You know, I just kept at it. And I always say about, if you have success about, you know, you have to be good, but you have to be lucky, you know, no success yeah. comes without luck, you know, and, and I had both, like I worked hard, I did well, but things happen at the right time for me, you know? And so yeah. I got there, you know what I mean? But, it, a lot of it was my grandma, you know, just, just being near her and being at a great school and a great program. Like it's what I wanted, man. It's just what I wanted for a long time. Wow. So was there any wow. other schools recruiting you? I mean, I know you had Stanford here at seventh grade. It's like, if everything pan out <laughs> on my senior year, I'm going to Stanford. I don't give a That's hell right. who recruited me. That's right. That's what it was. Uh, a lot of schools recruited me. You know, I would have probably gone to play at Wisconsin uh, if I wouldn't have gone to Stanford. Mm although, you know, there was a couple other schools that were interesting to me, like Princeton was interesting, the Ivy, uh, they were a good school in the Ivy at the time. And I was really into academics, but, you know, so I thought about that. My dad played at Tennessee, you know, and they recruited mm -hmm. me really hard. And so there was a second where I said, that would be interesting. You know, their coach, Buzz Peterson, he would send me like a FedEx every day. And I was like, oh, I was feeling the love, you know, and I was like, yeah, this could be cool. 
uh, but but ultimately, you know, it was it was Stanford a bus for me, man. And and luckily, I got it done. Hey, man, that's a that's a true that's a that's what we call a hoop dream, man. When you make a declaration. And some years before, and you say, damn that, I'm going, I don't care what happened. My environment ain't going to take me down. Ain't nobody going to take me off this goal. I want to get a full ride to this school. And you did that, man. That's a, that's what we call a hoop dream, man. Well, coming from you both, it means a lot, believe me. But I, I appreciate <laughs> it. And yeah, listen, it, it, it's a story. And that's why the game is so powerful. You know, it can, and you, it can take you different places. You can find out who you are, what you're made of. And. And even mm-hmm. if you don't achieve it, because that happens too. I've had things I put my mind to and set my sights on that I didn't get, but you still learn about yourself. You still go right. through it. You know what I mean? So it's always it's always for the greater good, you know? Mm-hmm. How was Coach Montgomery in your recruiting process? Uh, it was, so since I wanted to go there so bad, like I was, I was all, I was, you know, always looking for him in gyms and uh, he, the program was so strong at the time that he had a lot of leverage. You know, they could get, you know, for a kid like myself, I had a really good academic profile. I, my, I was doing well on the court. Like there was a certain kind of profile of a player that they could get, you know? So he had more leverage mm-hmm. than me in a sense. Uh, but wow. once I, once I had that 45 and once I kind of, you know, we kind of came together, like he was great. I still remember him calling him in my hotel room saying, you know, he calls me Danny, like Danny, we love you at Stanford. We want you to come here. You know, and it, it was, mm-hmm. it wasn't a lot of, he didn't have to sell me too hard. Cause I think I, I showed my hand pretty early, you know, but, uh, Right. He was cool. But I'll tell you one thing, like when I took my recruiting visit there, he said, Danny, let's go for a ride around campus, man. I sat in the in the uh, passenger seat of his Porsche. He drove me around, you know, <laughs> tops down, sh- sun is shining. I'm like, you know what? This is all right, man. I can get you. <laughs> this, you know? right, uh, right. But I'll tell you, like, he's an excellent coach, man. I, I learned a lot from him, you know, and you know how it is yeah. as a player. You don't always get along with your coaches. You don't always agree yeah. with the decisions they make. And so him and I butted heads a lot. But he he's a great basketball coach now i learned so much from him and mm. so I, i'm grateful that he believed in me brought me to stanford and then you know i got, got to play under him and you know my sophomore year at stanford we were the number one team in the country so he went to the golden state warriors after that year so i only had two years with him but man i i really learned a lot from him he's a great coach yeah so so when you when you got on stanford i mean saying you're gonna go there when you was at that seventh grade you was like man i'm going i'm going to this school now you actually get there give us that first day stepping on there you know going into that first practice pickup game yeah man like you know i was a competitive guy right as both of you were like and it's funny how goals work right like you have a goal it's all you're thinking about you achieve it but then it's like click you you have to you take it to a new level now you know so now yep. I'm like okay you you want to play in the league this now you're at Stanford that next stop you know so I was very much like again focused and just trying to kind of like show my worth and you know Stanford was a type of program where the first two years you you come off the bench you earn your keep which Coach Montgomery built a juggernaut right he knew exactly what he was doing but for someone like me he was kind of headstrong like really wanted to play you know that's why we had a little tension at times and. Uh, I was just hell bent on kind of proving myself. And so the competition, man, was a whole different ball game. You know, now everyone was one of the best players in their state. Everyone was first team. You know, so it's like, you got to figure it out. So my it took a little adjustment for my game, you know, mentally, physically, you know, I had to get a lot stronger, but, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my, my teammates supported me, the coaching staff supported me. And, uh, you know, I, I, I played as a freshman, you know, I got, you know, decent minutes. And so, you know, we were a four seed in the NCAA tournament that year, you know, so we were a good team or right. a top 25 team, like guys, like, and you know how it is. Like I put on a Jersey. I remember my first day I got the Jersey, I put it on and I looked in the mirror. I'm like, damn dude, like it says Stanford on it. And my name's on the back, you know, like uh-huh. people watch college athletes on TV and you're like, Oh, you probably, you know, it's not a big deal, whatever, but like, no, it's a big deal. Particularly when you get there, like I was looking in the mirror, like taking right. a picture, you know, sending it to my parents, like, Dude, it was, it was yeah. amazing. I, it was, I was so just happy just to be there. I know you're married now, but how was that campus like? Oh, I, I understand. <laughs> what you're, listen, we had a good time in college. Man. You're like, the, the social scene is fun. And listen, like, you know how college is. There's girls, there's guys, there's friends. It's all, but it's all there for you. And uh, it, we, I made amazing friends and yeah. we had fun. We went, we partied, we did our thing. We worked hard in the classroom we work hard on the court you know people people are very interesting so while we had the college fun and you know we we did our things like 
we just really got to know each other. Like I got to know really interesting people. And what's really cool about Stanford is it's such an international school. So I got to know people right. from around the world. And that was mm. pretty cool for me because I, I didn't know it at the time. I'd end up playing basketball all over, all over the world. But, you know, there are people in my dorm, you know, literally from, from Europe, from different continents. Like that was really cool. And uh, I'll tell you one other thing that's really cool about Stanford. Like, yeah, I was like, I came in as a basketball player and I had like that hoopla around basketball. But like there are people there doing things that are way more important than just playing basketball. You know, I had someone in my dorm who was like doing research in a lab to cure this disease. And I had this person volunteering. Like, so people like you get treated as kind of a normal student, you know, which, yeah. which, which is fun because at the end of the day, like, yes, you're a basketball player. You kind of get that shine, but you just want to be one, one of the, one of the people, you know, one, a freshman student kind of doing your thing. And so, uh, it, it's just an amazing place. I, I can't say enough about it, man. I had such a good experience there every kid should try to get to experience it at least one time. You know what I'm saying? I mean, cause I mean, I wouldn't take nothing away from my college experience. I mean, the only thing that I would tell kids, the number one thing, and this is what all coaches tell you, time management, use yep. your time management wisely because most of your day is already carved out for what you're going to do. So true, man. Yeah. When you have basketball, it's a full-time job, but like you're spending whatever it is like, 20 hours a week, four, I don't even know. It's, it's, it's all day. You're lifting, you're eating, you're stretching, you're icing, you're working out, you're playing. Like, so yeah, you have to, but you learn that, you know, and it, it helps yep. when, when you have a job and you have kids, like, you know, like <laughs> you're, you know what it is just to like commit to the things you have to do and, and make it all work. Can you, can you expound on that a little bit? Because you had said earlier, um, when you got there, um, everybody's good. Everybody's great. Everybody's either first team, all area, all American. Mm -hmm. um, how did you process the not playing time? Because this thing in age, the, the kids are so used to being, you know, loved upon, greeted with the greatest yep. respect. And then that realization is, yeah, but this guy done put his time in first and you got to sit and wait. How, how no did you doubt about that? it. It was easier for me as a freshman because you're a freshman, you're figuring it out. And I was getting some minutes. I was playing like 10 minutes a game. You know, so I was like, okay, like I'm contributing on a good team. I felt a lot more kind of comfortable just like paying my dues. But when my sophomore year rolled around, I felt like I developed and I thought I, I deserved more or I wanted more. Whether or not I deserved it or not, I don't know, but I wanted more. And I didn't get it. And so that was hard for me. And I didn't have the maturity that I needed at the time. And you know how it is. Like, I was like, that, like sports are, it's mental. You know, of course, there's a physical component, but man, the mm -hmm. mental side is so crucial. And like, I did not have whatever I needed at that time to be mm. able to just say, you know what, be patient, pay your dues. Because what was interesting is like we would have some NBA players come through Stanford to play, you know, in the summers and, and pick up and stuff. And I would compete. And sometimes I would outplay guys. So I would tell my dad, man, I just outplayed, you know, X, Y, Z, but like I can't mm -hmm. get on the court, you know. And so I, I couldn't deal with it. And so I had a terrible sophomore year. Now, my team was the number one team in the country. We started the season 26 and 0. So we won mm. our first 26 games, man. And I'm talking about Pac-10, Arizona, Washington, UCLA, USC. Like, I'll tell you, Arizona starting five that year. It was uh, Mustafa Shakur, Salim Stoudemire, Hassan Adams, Andre Iguodala, and Channing Frye. Those are all mm -hmm. NBA players. And we, you know, Damn. we beat them in Tucson. We beat them at home. Like, we just had it going. And so while it was really cool to be part of that, I, I, I didn't have my game going and that was hard for me. You know, I think, mm. you know, listen, as basketball players, we're all selfish in, in a way. You don't get mm -hmm. to the highest mm -hmm. levels unless you're selfish, you know, and I'm no different. Of course, I, I was committed to the team, of course, like support my teammates, but inside you want to do well. And so I had a, a much worse sophomore year than I did freshman just because mentally mm. I just wasn't at the place where I could kind of accept waiting my turn, which Coach Montgomery was right, man. We were number one in the country. Who, who's right, him or me? Like he right. was doing it right, you know? And, I just didn't have the maturity to deal with it. Mm. And that's always so difficult because I remember my days at Marquette. We went on like this 11-0 run, and I kept telling Coach, man, I can do more. But he kept looking at me and saying, but, yeah, we're we winning. I'm right. like, yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, how did you explain you can be winning more when you win it, you know? <laughs> right. so, you can only win. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so, no, I understand that aspect, and I really want our, our young listeners to hear that because – you're right, that the mental aspect of the game, if you're not careful, you can get lost yeah. and yeah. go from 
barely playing to never playing because your attitude can change along in that mental aspect. And you start thinking about other things. Why am I here? You know, man, come yeah, on mm-hmm. me all the way out here. And he doesn't want me on the team. Or what a lot of athletes say, man, the coach doesn't even like me. Did you ever right. process anything like that? Or was it different for you? Regarding like, do the coaches like me? Yeah. When you're down in the dumps, you question everything. So yeah, like I did, I was right. like, I, you know, and I think I even said that to my coaches, like, why'd you bring me here? You know, like, like, <laughs> and, you know, and I'm sure like a lot of players have said that to their coaches. Right. And, and I had assistants who tried to like, di- like help me and, and people did support me. But, you know, I, I think like all, all instincts are good, but only to a certain point. So it's good to be motivated and it's good to want it now, but one, but you have to cut that at some point. And I wish I would have mm-hmm. known what that point was back then, because you have so much more. And I'd say that to young people who are listening now, like you have so much more time than you think you do at that yes. moment. You think it has to be now, but like when you're a sophomore in, in college, junior in college, whatever it is, like you, you have so much more time, but you know, for us as players, like you want it now. And so that's good to a point because it keeps you motivated. It keeps you competitive, but I wish I could have chilled out a little bit earlier than I did because I think I could have performed better. Well, I mean, that's why you get four years. So, you know, that's how right. you come back in that junior year, though? What, what was your mindset that year? I'm, I, may, I may have teed you up nicely for that question, but I'm just going to drop it on you right now, okay? I went from averaging 3.4 points as a sophomore to 18 points as a junior. So I was, <laughs> and actually it was 17.9. But I'm going to say 18 because you got me on the other 18, one. 18, right. <laughs> Don't Kick say 17, man. I'll go, I'll go crazy on that. Uh, no, but I, listen, I was the most improved player in the country. No other player in Division One basketball had that big of an increase in scoring average. And I was the most improved player in the history of the basketball program. And listen, I worked, I think, because I was so bad as a sophomore, mm-hmm. I worked so maniacally hard that summer mm-hmm. to, you know what I mean? But mm-hmm. I also think like, you know, I, I didn't, the opportunity was there for me, so that helped. But, you know, again, like, and I, I, again, I want to, I'll keep going back to the movie because, like, it's always in my head. Like, you saw it with you two, right? Like, you go through ups and downs, you learn from it, you get better, you know, yeah. you take your team upstate, you know, these different things. Like, uh, it was that, it was that way for me, man. Like, you know, I, I went through something rough as a sophomore for me personally, but then I worked and I had another opportunity and I made the most of it. Yeah, that's hey, and it's so crazy you said that, like, you know, just in a year and a half or two years uh, that everything just changed around for you, you know, in, in your junior year, you went from average of 18, you know, that's crazy. I got to tell you this, man, because you'll both appreciate this. Like, when I was a sophomore, I heard people saying, like, how does he even play college basketball? Like, you know, because I was, I was not a good guy. So it's like, he shouldn't even be playing college basketball, you know? And it was, it was like months later, you know, where like, it was less than a year later. Now there's a new season. And my first three, I think after three games that year, I was averaging like 21 points and nine and a half rebounds. Okay. So, Damn. and I read in the newspaper, he's a potential first round pick in the NBA draft. And I said to myself, man, how quickly things can change and how you, you should never believe anything. You never be too low, never be too high because it's really what, you know what I mean? Like people are saying, I'm terrible. Now I'm great. And by the way, my my junior year ended early because I tore my ACL. Like I was telling you, Will, like, mm-hmm. and, and it was in a nationally televised game at the end of the year. Tiger Woods was sitting courtside. Like, you know, it was at the worst time and I tore my ACL. But so I was I was down and then I was really up and boom, just like that, I'm down again. And then now all of a sudden, so I don't believe any of it. You know, I was never that bad. Yeah. I was never that good. I was just kind of doing the best I could do. Talk about that a little bit, though. Because um, I remember when I tore my knee. It was the same thing, man. I was, I was really kind of like, I figured it out. That's what I yep. like to call it. I, you know, whatever you, you, you processing, you kind of figure it out at that moment, yep. but then you have this, you know, accident, this injury. Talk, talk to us a little about like, man, what, what did you think at that moment? And did, did, did you think that the game was over or give us, give us man. what's going on with you? I knew right away that something really serious had happened because you know how it is when you play like, you know, like, you know, your body, right? And, and I felt something in my knee that I had never felt before. And like, I didn't know anything about that type of injury. But I knew that's what I had. If that makes sense. You know, sometimes something mm-hmm. happens where you're mm-hmm. like, that can't be good. And it was so shocking. And I met you, my, my grandma several times, you know, she came to every game I played at Stanford, and, you know, and then I know, we'll, we'll talk a bit about the book I, I wrote. But 
you know, my grandmother is a Holocaust survivor. So if you talk about, you know, people persevering, like my grandma's my hero, she, what she's been through and what, and, and the positivity she has and the life she's made, like it, it's the greatest inspiration for me. And so, you know, when I got hurt, she was sitting 20 feet away and it was of course like, you know, your mind, like you can't really process it. And when I finally kind of came, came to, you know, and, and kind of like got my bearings, she was kneeling down next to me, rubbing my head. So she had, came, so my grandmother was right there with me. She had come down cause I was, you know, in trouble and she was there with me, you know? And so that's something I still remember, but listen, guys, I mean, it was crushing you. Cause you, you both know like, ho Hey, hoop dreams. Like you put your heart and soul and your dreams and, and everything into it, especially when you're younger, you know, like now everyone's, you're older, you have kids, you realize there's, there's more to life, you know, than basketball. But mm -hmm. when you're a young mm -hmm. kid, man, like that's all you, that's all you're thinking about. So it, it's really everything to you. And, um, it was crushing. Like, you know, listen, as soon as, you know, I remember my, uh, the trainers kind of taking me out of the arena and the arena's silent, you know? Mm -hmm. And as soon as we got out of people's views, I asked them to stop and I just started crying. Mm. I just, I just all came out of me, you know, I just was like, yeah, because I knew. And so listen, th it was, it, it was a rough thing that happened, but you know, someone said to me that night, if this is the worst thing that happens to you in your life, you should be very lucky. You know, mm. and it's true, you know, it's, yeah. because life is, is bigger. And so, listen, you know, you have to kind of take what you're given. And, and that was my hand. And, you know, it was unfortunate at the time. But, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't change what happened with my life, man, because, you know, everything happens for a reason. I don't know how you ain't get the strength with, to just when grandmama came down there and rubbing your head, I would have been like, that's all the strength I need. I'm coming right. I'm yeah. coming back. I'm coming back strong. Grandma back gave me the energy, baby. I would have popped up, tried to run, and just fallen down because I had no right, lift. Right. But at least, yeah, no. But but I felt like that inside, man, because you know how it is. Like at that moment, man, you're you're like yep. broken inside because like, oh, this happened. But to have her with me, yeah, like if anything would have gotten me back up from that moment, it would have been her. Mm. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful. Wow. Yeah, man. And so, Whew. but listen, like it took me it took me eight months to get back on the court, and so my senior year, you know, and, and actually it speaks to what I just said earlier about like, you always have more time than you think because, you know, I was first team all pack 10. I thought I was going to play in the league, you know? And so I had an assistant coach who said to me after I hurt my knee, cause it, it was, it was at the end of the year. So it was pretty close to the next year starting, you know? Mm -hmm. So he said, you thought about red shirting and I almost ripped his head off. We still joke about it. Cause I didn't want to hear red shirt. <laughs> it's like, I'm, you know, I'm going, I'm focused, but honestly, like, if I would have redshirted, I probably would have gotten to the league because I had a really good rookie year as a pro in, in Germany where I averaged double figures, you know, so if I was still in college doing that, I probably would average 20, you know, it would have been different, but mm -hmm. I wish I would have been able to know, like, don't be in such a rush, you know, don't be in such a rush. Right. And you see, know? at that time, at that time, it's all about how, how our mind frames was, okay, we go to school for four years. You know, and, and the next thing is to either go overseas or go to the NBA. Somebody telling right. you the red shirt, like to that's like delaying your dream, putting your dream yep. on hold. You like, hell no, I want to go now. Same thing Will said in, in the movie. He was like, you don't want to wait till next year? <laughs> he said, no, shit, I want to test this now. Yeah. <laughs> and and look, I told you, I, I watched it two weeks ago. Well, when I saw that scene, you know, of course, you think about your own. I thought about myself and like I saw me and you, you know, because. But it's the same for all young, motivated players, you know, almost nine people, nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 would make that decision, you know. But that's what they need to do. They need to start giving high school players a red shirt. Yeah, you get hurt, you should get another year. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Well, hey, Dan, we, we want to be mindful of your time. So AG and I, we got this thing, man, we call halftime. Okay. We got a quick few hitters for you. And my first question for you are, what are the three loudest opposing stadiums you played in? Matt Court at Oregon, Cal, Haas Pavilion at Cal, mm. and I'm in Gonzaga. What? Oh, we, Gonzaga was yeah. We played in Gonzaga my uh, my senior year. Man, it was it was rocking. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> okay. Uh, your favorite city you lived in, and what did you like about it? I lived in Herzliya, Israel. When I was playing in Israel, it's right on the beach. Amazing food, just beautiful. Like we had friends there, man. My wife and I, we had such an amazing experience there. So. Yeah, I, I love living in Herzliya, man. It was it was beautiful. 
Who are the three toughest players you ever guarded? Ooh, toughest players I ever guarded. Uh, well, I'll tell you guys who who I who I yeah who I have memories on. I'm not saying these are the best players I ever guarded, although they're they're all very good players. But right. Jason Capono, when he was mm-hmm. at UCLA, because he was a mm-hmm. senior when I was a freshman, and I got a lot of minutes, and and I actually started the second half, and I remember saying, "Oh, I'm starting the second half against UCLA." Man, Capono hit two threes on me so fast. I'm like, I remember just chasing <laughs> him around. I don't know. So I always think Capono. Uh, I mentioned Gonzaga, Adam Morrison at Gonzaga. Man, I was chasing him around, and it's funny because after the game, our because I had my I was recovering from my knee injury, and our trainer who worked with me said, "Man, I'm proud of you, man. You 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 did such a good job defensively, and you worked so hard." And I look at the box score. Yeah, yeah, he had 34. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> That's a 34. Nice. He had had a bunch that weren't on me, but a bunch were on me. And what made it funnier is he was the third pick in the draft that that, that year, and the highlights were against Stanford. So as he gets selected, I see him jumper in my face. I'm like, do you have to do it to me? Do you have to do it to me? Right. Uh, Right. He scored on other people. Oh, man. he. I mean, he averaged 30. You know, he he averaged 30. Uh, And then, man, I'll – you know, there was – there were so many guys, you know, my my professional when I played pro, who who were really tough. I'll tell you one in Spain was Juan Carlos Navarro. Mm. Mm. You know, he had a successful NBA career. Uh, man, was he something? He was so good. I mean, he's one of the best players in Europe. I mean, he was a good pro in the NBA, but that's a guy maybe you wouldn't expect. And keep in that mind, dude, that played dude played in Memphis, right? Exactly from Memphis. He had an amazing floater, but like it, it just like his game was. It was just an impossible task and he's much smaller than me and i wasn't that quick to begin with so i remember like switching off on him a couple times i'm like man this is a problem for me <laughs> <laughs> okay your favorite sneakers you played in oh man i was in seventh grade you know that that penny shoe where it had the scent sign remember it's oh, like yeah. the iconic penny man the one cent I, I was loving those man when i was like I, you know six i think i was seventh grade man i just thought those were the coolest and i just, i love those what's the most memorable college game you had the most memorable college game I had was against Arizona my junior year at home. Uh, it was in January, and it was the year where I was playing really well. You know, and I was okay. I was one of the leading scorers in the conference. But in my mind, I was always telling myself, you know, do people think you're for real? Because I was so bad the prior year, you know? So I, was, I always had that thing in my mind, like, keep going. Don't, don't let up. Don't let up. Because people are just waiting. You know how it is. You tell yourself stories. Mm-hmm. And Mm-hmm. We played Arizona at home on national TV. My family flew in be- just for the week of my mom, my dad. I think my dad was there, my sister. And in my head, I was like, this is it, man. Like, because it was Arizona. Like, they had all NBA players. And yeah. And uh, and I had 29, you know, at home, and we won. And I remember, mm. like, after that game, I was like, dude, you're for real. Like, you're for real. You know, in my head, I was yeah. like, that was, like, I knew yes. at that moment, I was like, you're for real now, you know? And so I, I'll never forget it, man, because it was – and I remember – seeing my sister in the stands, you know, we're so close and she always supported me so much and looking at her yeah. and being like, it's not like we did it, you know, but kind of like, here we are. Like it's, it's happening. Like you said, Will, you have these moments where, where it's happening to me. I was mm-hmm. like, Oh, it's, it's happening. You know, it's easy. All you have to do is go to mybookie.ag, sign up and use our promo code hoop dreams. And my bookie will double your first deposit instantly up to 1000. How's that for fast money? You heard DG at the halftime, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so when you finished up your your college, how, how was it? I mean, because you're coming back from injury, did did you did you get any NBA tryouts? Did you have to get an agent? What what was that process? Yeah, I had an agent, and I did I did you know I had workouts for NBA teams. You know, I think people knew that I had promise because of the junior year I had, but. So I averaged 12 points a game my senior year. So I always, I'll always i tell you that I was the most improved player in the country. I might have been the least improved, but I don't say that. I never <laughs> did those numbers, you know. We don't need to do that math. But, I, you know, so because I, I played with a knee brace, you know, I just I didn't have it, you know. And so uh, but, you know, since I had I was still OK and I, and I had such a good uh, junior year that I got some workouts. I had an agent. You know, I went to some draft camps and things like that. But I just wasn't I wasn't there yet. You know, I just wasn't there. And so. I went undrafted and, uh, you know, my agent found a great opportunity for me in Germany, you know, in the top league in Germany, which was a strong league. It was a good team. And, you know, that's where I spent my first year. I had never been, you know, outside, outside of the United States, you know, at that point. And really? so, 
And I'd always, and I'd grown up around the NBA. So that's what success was in my mind, you know, it was NBA. And so, mm. you know, I, I didn't really know much about European basketball, but man, it was, I mean, I, I just had the, the best run and started starting with that first year in Germany, like awesome team, you know, just doing, you know, ultimately I was doing what I always wanted to do, you know, that they were paying me to play ball. And right. um, so, and you, you learn when you go over there, like this level is super high and the game is played, at, at, you know, in, in, in just a great way over there. So I, I had a great experience. And, you know, I know that we'll talk a bit about the book and my family's story, but, you know, Germany was a little bit complicated for my family, right? Because mm -hmm, of the Holocaust, mm -hmm. right? It was, the, you know, Absolutely. and so, and, and, and I, I, I mentioned in my book that I'm probably the only professional basketball player who called his grandmother to ask her permission to sign a contract. Because when my agent said, you know, you, you have an opportunity in Germany, I said, well, I want to make sure my grandma's okay with that which mm -hmm. she 100% was, you know, she's, she's the most amazing person, you know, she told me, she said, you know, sons are not responsible for the sins of their fathers, you know, so they, mm. you know, the, the generations before, you know, bad things happen, but you go enjoy and, and I did have a great experience there. And I, I love living there. I mean, because I'm, I'm quite sure grandma knew, you know, this, this is your dream, this is your opportunity to go and do something you love. And I, I don't want to hinder, hinder that from him. So that I, I believe that man, that was so much love right there. A hundred percent, man. She, she, my biggest supporter, and she supported me through that, you know, and she didn't even think twice, man. There was not a hesitation because mm. I said, you know, is that going to be a problem? And she said, mm. what's the problem? So you, you go like, you know, you do what you want to do, what you've always wanted to do. And so, yeah, it was, it, it, it meant a lot that her support. And then, you know, once I got over there and now it's funny because we talked about high school to college. Now all the, all the, all conference players in college, like if you didn't play in the league, which like, there are only, however, 60-so 60, 60 guys drafted. Now now this is a different level. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. you know, you're playing. It, it's funny, like, yeah, I got older. I still remember one of my – I was 22, you know, when I started my pro career, and I had a teammate. I think he was 38, you know, and right. so he was – and he was a legend in Europe, and he was at the tail end of his career. And one of the first practices, there, we were playing the same position. There was a loose ball, and I dove on it in practice. And as soon as I got up, he just walked over to me, and he tapped me on the shoulder. He said, hey, young fella. Don't do that anymore. <laughs> you know, and I said, okay, I got you. I got you. Wow. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm diving on the floor in practice, you know, and, and right. believe me, it didn't take that long for me when someone dove on the floor in practice, be like, hey, don't do that. Don't, don't do, do that. that. Right, you know? right, right. So it, it, was, it was also an adjustment. He said, this ain't college no more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is college. Now, now yep. tell us, how does, how does the overseas basketball differs from the North American basketball, meaning that how many times you practice a day, how many games it is, how's the traveling, all of that. Oh man, it's so different in so many ways. So just the structure is different. Like in the NBA, right? You play 82 games, so you're playing two, three, four times a week. Right. In Europe, you're playing once a week in your domestic league. And if your team is playing in an international competition, like with other countries, with teams from other countries, you might play twice a week. So my first mm. year, we only played once a week. So we're practicing twice a day, you know, most days, leading up to that game on Saturday. So it's a little bit like football. Yeah. But, but if you think about it, because you have so, so you know, few games, every possession is more important. You know, they're 40-minute mm. games, and you only play 34 of them. So, you know, in, there's no wiggle room. There's no, you know, you lose three games in a row, that's 10% right. of your season. You know, so it's every possession – you know, it's so precise. You know, the travel is different. Like we, we would bus to games. So I'd be on the bus for 12 hours. You know, it's not, Damn. it's not like the NBA. Oh yeah, man. Like, you know, and, and again, this is like a, this is a good, you know, top league in Europe, really good players. You know, guys, right. we have guys on our team who played in the league, like shit, really ride the bus, man. Just ride the bus. Just like ride the this bus. is how it works. <laughs> That's it, man. Just get your ass on the bus and ride it. Like we'll be there and then we'll play. And you know, you're sharing hotel rooms and, it's just a little bit, it's, it's, it's different, you know, but, mm -hmm. uh, and the basketball is different, you know, it's a little bit, the rules are, are different. So it's more physical, you know, the, I think the pass is valued a little more just because yeah. you can be more physical defensively. So it's harder to just do things off the dribble. Right. And it, it's, listen, I learned and as me for someone who grew up around the game and, and my dad played, so I was always talking about it. And I thought I, I knew the game fairly well, like, I learned so much from being over there about basketball. It's just, you know, the way it's played. It's three things that I that I know about overseas basketball. Moving without the ball, passing is good first before shooting, 
And why does the damn rim, the gold, the net look so much bigger than the United <laughs> States? Have you all noticed that? <laughs> like it just it looks like a a peach basket. I think the net is cut a little differently in Europe, man. Because I so I think it makes the yeah. rim look bigger, but it does. It does. It does. It does look a little bigger. You know, and the rules are a little different too. Where when the, once the ball touches the rim on defense, you can bat it off, and on offense, you can put it in. So I'll tell you, I, I this, my, my first year, <laughs> our point guard. I still laugh about this because. I wasn't a great leaper. You know, I could dunk the ball. I dunk the ball every once in a while, right? But right. our point guard shot a jumper, and it bounced up, and it was probably going to go in. But in Europe, you could put it in, and I just happened to get the timing right. So I dunked it in, you know? So it was a tip dunk, and, you know, the crowd was going crazy, and my teammates were going crazy, everyone except the dude who shot it, because I basically <laughs> took his points. Yeah. So I remember he kind of was looking at me, and I got my tip dunk, but it was, you know, <laughs> yeah, but... Like I, I still remember that, but no, yeah. man, like, yeah, th th those, uh, yeah, that overseas game, man, it, it's, it's different, but it's no joke. So, man, you have an amazing overseas career. Along the way, you pick up some citizenships. You get Romanian, Israeli. That's I mean, right. And your dad's side of the family is Romanian, right? That's right. So he's from Romania, and that's why I was eligible for a Romanian passport. And so mm. I was able to get that because it helps, you know, as overseas, I didn't count as an American. I counted as a European, you know, the last several years of my career. So that kind of helps, you know, because they have quotas in different leagues. Mm. I love that. Yeah. Well, can you talk about your dad's background? And, you know, this leads us into the book you wrote. Yeah. Tell us about his childhood and the book by the grace of the game and why you decide to write it. Absolutely. So. Listen, my, my dad, you know, is pretty well known in basketball as a player, as an executive, but few people know that he's the only player in NBA history whose parents survived the Holocaust, you know, and that's wow. my grandmother and my grandfather. Yeah. And so, you know, if you talk to my dad, he, he has a New York accent, you know, he's big, and you know, big imposing guy, but my dad grew up in Romania under communism, you know, and he came to the United States when he was nine years old. And so his native language is Hungarian. And, um, mm. You know, but people really don't know this side of his background. And so, you know, for me, having grown up, just kind of knowing what my grandparents went through, what my dad went through, you know, fleeing communism yeah. as a refugee coming to the United States. And I'll tell you, and you both appreciate this. So when my dad got to America, you know, again, parents are Holocaust survivors, like don't speak English, have to build a life for themselves. Uh, you know, he, he had an older brother who, who was his hero. You know, and my uncle was diagnosed with leukemia and and passed away about a year after they got to America. So, mm. you know, it's a very rough childhood, right? Where, you know, and he's in New York City trying to figure it out. And he just went to the local park to learn English and to make friends. And he just started playing basketball. And and when you talk what? about hoop dreams, right? Like, that that's what it is, right? Like, and, and my hoop dream is different. Like, I grew up differently and basketball did that for me, you know? Uh, but, you know, my dad found basketball at the park in Queens in New York. And, you know, before you knew it, like he was good and then he was really good and then he was really, really good. So he was an All-American and, you know, went to the University of Tennessee, you know, with Bernard King. And, you know, about 10 years after coming to the United States, not speaking English as an immigrant, as a refugee, he won a gold medal for the United States in basketball. You know, so just so like when you talk about hoop dreams, right, like this yeah. is what the game can do for people, for a family. And, you know, so for me, like I grew up so I grew up differently. You know, I grew up with that privilege. And, you know, yep. I'm just so grateful for everything the game did. And, you know, I've done a lot of writing in my background and I always knew this was a story I really wanted to tell because it's not just my story. It's, it's we all have this story, right? So I, I know your version. Exactly. Yeah. It's generational and, and it kind of transcends too, because like I saw your hoop dream, you know, and now we're talking about mine and this is my family's and yeah. everyone's got one, man. Everyone's got one, you know? So that's why I'm, I'm proud to share the story. I think it's important, you know, to share it with the world. And uh, yeah, it's, it's coming out, you know, right around the corner. It's available for, for order on Amazon and all the places you buy books. So, man, I'm just grateful for anyone who supports it. And, yeah, man, it, it just means the world to me. DG, let me just give your pops some just the utmost respect and credit in Absolutely. life. This dude, Absolutely. nine years old, man, 10 years old, he can't speak no English. He, You mean to tell me this dude goes to the park mm -hmm. and that's how – he became and made some of himself, made right. who he was of Ernie Grunfeld. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny, too, because 
my grandparents, you know, again, everyone, they lost their son, they lost their family. So they're healing, but they also need to make ends meet, you know, so there's a lot going on. And my, and my, my grandfather was a great sportsman. He was a world ranked ping pong player and he was a soccer player. So he loved sports, but he, they just worked because they had to build a life. So they, my grandfather worked seven days a week. My grandmother worked six. So they didn't really know what my dad, like they knew he was playing basketball, you know? And like, so I just think about how I grew up, like my, both my parents are at my games and supporting me and right. driving me. My dad was just hooping, but they didn't even know what that meant. And then they got a call when my dad was a junior in high school. Think about it. He's a junior in high school and, and his high school coach called them at the store, at their store, and their fabric store. And they said, he said, you know, you got to watch this kid pl play basketball. He's pretty good. And they went to the gym. They closed their store and saw him play. And, you know, my grandfather used to make him come to the store to work. And after he saw him play basketball one time, he said, you never have to come again. You <laughs> never have to come again. Because he really, because, you know, and they didn't know that the game could do this much for a person, for a family. But, you know, it just took, it took our family to places that no one could have imagined. That's why I'm so grateful to the game. So I mean so much for me to talk to you two because, your story means so much to me just in general, but knowing what my family went through, knowing what you yeah. both went through, like I saw that up close and personal, like we all have our, our own stories with the game, man. So that's why, you know, this means a lot and, and the book means a lot. Man, when I when I saw the 30 for 30 on, on your pops, I mean, you would think like at Tennessee, you know, the racism and stuff that he had to go, yeah. that, that they was going through as a team and, and the nation at that time. But for him, one of his best friends to be black. Oh, yeah. And and he had a relationship with this dude was like, oh, I don't care about what no outside people think or what they, you know, what they calling me because I'm I'm hanging out with this guy. Absolutely. And they're, they're you know, my dad and Bernard are still close to this day. You know, I talk to Bernard, you know, I call him Uncle B, you know, because they really? played, not only do they, oh, yeah, still to this day, man. I, uh, they played with each other at Tennessee, but also in the NBA. So when I was growing up, you know, my dad and Bernard were playing for the Knicks. Bernard lived up the street from us. So I would come home from school and my dad and Bernard are at the kitchen table and he'd, he'd lift me up, you know, that's <laughs> uncle B, you know? And so, uh, Damn. yeah. And you know, my, from where my dad comes from and from what happened, listen, my, my grandmother, who I've talked about, both of her parents and five siblings were killed in the Holocaust. Right. So given, given my family's background, like, you know, people are people. You get to know people for who they are. And, and my grandfather always said that to my dad. You don't yeah. ever, don't make an assumption of, for a person for what they believe, what they look like, anything. You get to know a person and you get to know people and then you decide, you know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. he just, he grew up with, with that way of thinking. And a lot of it, I think was because of like on what his family went through, because they saw what can happen when people, you know, when people hate, when people, you know, when there's prejudice, when people make assumptions and things like that. So have you always had a passion for writing? I have. I have. And it's funny because everyone knew I love to play basketball because like that's, you know, that's external and people see it. But I would come home from games and I would write stories or I'd write poems. And, you know, my mom always said, oh, he's going to be a writer. Like she could see in me that I just love to do it. And so, mm. you know, it's, it's, it's a great, great love in my, in my life. And I've done a lot of it. You know, I've done have contributing writing positions to websites and I've published, you know, 40 plus like articles and things like that. So I've really worked hard at it. But like this book, man, is is really kind of what it's all been leading to. Dude, you picked the perfect name. Yeah, that's exactly where I was going to, by the grace of the game. Like, why that title? I mean, there's so many like nuggets just in the title alone. Why that? Well, we, we were given my wife Sam props earlier. So we have to give her credit again because you know, that was really her brainchild. But, you know, we were, you know, a title. It, it means so much. And we were thinking about it really for years, you know, like what's the right title? And we were throwing things around and, you know, for me by the grace of the game says so much because there is, and I've, I've, I've said this before, like basketball for my family was heaven sent. And it probably was for you both too. Like, and I, I you know, I know your backgrounds and, and some of the things you both were going through, like you have this game come into your life that changes everything, you know? And, and I really always felt that way about basketball for my family. So like grace, you know, there's a kind of like something divine and like heaven sent around that. Mm -hmm. But then there's also like, you know, by the grace of the game, it kind of indicates like the game saved us. Yeah, mm -hmm. There was something here that really, that was, that was powerful that, so for those reasons, as soon as my wife, you know, we talked about it and it came out, I was like, yep, I like that. So when does the book come out? Is it available for pre-order? Can, can folks pre-order the book? Right now, yep. So 
Amazon, you know, always try to support independent bookstores. So wherever mm-hmm. you get your books, it's definitely available right now. Uh, it's, you know, I, I'm, plus I've had amazing support, you know, Ray Allen, who we all know, who's an amazing basketball player. A lot of people don't know that Ray was pointed, appointed to the board of the Holocaust Museum by President Obama. So Ray, Ray does amazing work around Holocaust education and remembrance. It's really a, a cause that he is so passionate about. And, you know, I'm lucky to know Ray because my dad was a GM of the Bucks when Ray w- was, was a shooting guard for the team. And I, I looked up to Ray in high school. I had his jersey on my wall, you know, like, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and Ray, Ray, uh, Ray wrote a foreword for the book, you know, which is really, really, really moving. And yeah, man. And listen, he, he, he's amazing. And as much as I admired and looked up to Ray as a player, I admire him even more as a, as a person. He, he's such an amazing guy. And so for him to kind of stand behind the story means a lot. And listen, it, it's got a lot of good uh, momentum and good excitement behind it. And ultimately for me, it, it means so much to tell the story. And I hope that people, you know, there's a lot of fun stuff too, right? There's basketball. There, there's right. you know, like, we're having fun today talk, telling these stories, like they're yeah. in the book, you know, but but there's also a, a history to it, you know, and a world history that's really important. So I important. hope that people can engage with a story about basketball, but also a pretty important family story and story about history that kind of needs to be told. Yeah. And DG, just just to let us know, when did you start writing the book? Like, how did, how did that whole, the process come out and when did you finish? Dude, it's five plus years in the making, you know? So what? It, it's really, I, I tell people, listen, if, if you want to like, make money or have time don't write a book like you know like it's not right you have to do it you have to do it because it's in your heart and because you love it and because you love the process and you love what you're writing about and so this is just as i said it meant the world to me so when i you know i went i went to business school at stanford after i retired from playing and so Mm -hmm. i had some time not only with my schoolwork but to you know explore some different things and i said i committed to it i was like okay i want to do this and so for about a year plus i just did the research you know, to try mm. to understand what happened, what happened to my grandmother's family, what happened to my dad, like what, what's the story? And then there came a point where I had to write it. And it's funny, and you two will appreciate this, like, you know, because I've done a lot of writing, but it was always kind of like on the side, like I would find time for it. And I thought, you know what, though, like, I had goals with basketball, and it was never on the side. It was, you know, it was never on the side. I woke up in the morning, I did, you're all in. And so I told my wife that I said, I have to approach this like I approached my basketball career. And so Every day for eight months at 6.02 a.m., because that's just when I set, the, set my alarm clock, I got up at 6.02, I went in the room, and I wrote for like an hour, 45 to two hours. Every, but, wow. And, and so, and, and when I was done with the first draft of the book, of course, my wife said, you know, I'm so proud of you. I said, thank you, but I only did one thing. I got my ass out of bed every day at the same time. That's it. Because if, if you get up and you sit in front of the computer, you'll do it. But it just is the discipline to do that. And honestly, like, basketball gave me that discipline right because that's what what i had kind of put my mind to before man so yeah yeah just that that was the writing process and since then it's just been editing and finding an agent and a publisher and mm-hmm. it's it's been a, an incredible journey and again like there's been so much positivity behind it and you know all the feedback and the reviews have been really really positive and great so like i'm just so so grateful for the support do you remember the last page that you wrote when you stopped when you was like it's done it's finished. <laughs> you know, it's funny because there are different versions of that. Because like at, like the first draft, like when you put the period on the last sentence the first time you write it, that's kind of like a whoa. Like, oh, my God. But then you ha- you you edit it and you rewrite it. You know? so rewrite like, it, yeah. Then you rewrite, and then you press send on this email. But then you got to do it again and you press send on this. So it happens, you know, it happens a bunch of times. But when you put that last period on that, on the first draft of it, there's something special about that. Because writing a book it does it it takes it's such a heavy lift so to know at least you did something and you you got a version of it out is such a big part of it so that first that first time you put that last period yeah that's amazing man that's an amazing feeling what publishing house did you use to print it so my publisher you'll appreciate is out of chicago so a publisher called triumph books Um, and so triumph specializes in sports titles and i think they really like this because it's it's bigger than sports You know, so Mm. there's this cool sports story, but the story is bigger than sports. You know, it's about family. It's about survival and perseverance and legacy, you know. So, again, we're we're all really excited about it. I'm excited to send you both copies so you can read it. Oh, man. I spent enough time. I spent enough time on your stories. You could spend a little time on my story. Yes. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. That's a given. That's a given. First of all, I, I can't wait to read it. Yeah, I can't. I can't wait to read it, man. I mean, just to hear 
again, the title alone draws you in, but your family story, you. your history, which yep. led you up to everything you're doing in life. And I'm even sure even what you're doing right now with technology and, and, and working with light speed ventures, how that plays so much of a role and what you've come through. So talk to us a little bit about that. What, what do you do with technology and light speed ventures? You know, as I mentioned, I went to business school at Stanford and I kind of got involved in the startup scene here in the, in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley. And so I joined a startup that we grew um, and, and I left that startup right when my son was born and I joined a venture capital firm. That's where I work now. And so our mm. firm invests in startups, you know, to help them grow. And I'm not on the investing team. I'm on the operations team. So I kind of work with the startups. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, as a basketball player, like, there are so many skills that you learn that you can apply to the working world, or as I said, to your relationships, to your parenting, but like communication, cooperation, you know, all, all these things that you need to have as a player, you know, you need to solve problems, you need to have strategy, you know, those are things that I kind of apply in my day to day, you know, with with, with companies and with with founders. And so, uh, yeah, listen, I, I, I love what I do now. And I, I can't tell you how often I reference my basketball career when really? I'm talking about my day job because you know the the people you work with they're your teammates you know you you right. have a coach you know so you, there's so many parallels you could draw so while I definitely like I'm, I'm pleased with my career now and I'm excited about it it's funny that basketball just always kind of stays with it. So Dan, give us a a, a glimpse into your title of operations when you directly working with them startups, what, what, what satisfaction do you get out of it? Yeah, for sure. So the satisfaction I get is, you know, I, first of all, I like working with people. I like helping people solve problems. So I'm, so I'll get, you know, an email from a startup founder or from, you know, we have folks in our community that we deal with. So people will reach out to me or I'll reach out that out to them proactively about kind of, you know, relationships that we can help them build or, or decisions we can help them make. And so, it's really a matter of kind of, of being of service to different people and trying to help them grow, help them meet people, help them solve problems, help them think through things. And so I like that because I, I look at basketball as the ultimate team sport, you know, where mm -hmm. you're always trying to, trying to, you know, win together and help. And, and that's a cool thing about the, the environment I'm in where it's about winning. You know, mm. you want to help companies grow and be the best and be the biggest and ultimately, hopefully, you know, have a great, great future, great outcome, whether it's, you know, having a IPO or selling for a lot of money or just having a great, you know, longstanding uh, company that they build. And so I, I, the competitiveness of it is something that I really enjoy. And also that collaboration piece. The people who run the whole company, how is it working with them? Tremendous. I mean, I'm, I'm really, really lucky. It's, it's a top firm and the people are extraordinary. I mean, they're very smart and they have great experience. They're also kind and they treat, treat people great. And so, yeah, I, mm. I couldn't be happier. And you know how it is, like when you when you play for a team, like the way you're treated, the way you're, you know, the coach treats you, the teammates, your teammates management, it makes all the difference. And, you know, I landed in, in a really, really great spot. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for for where I'm at now. And, you know, I tell you, you know, family first. So I have a you know, two and a half year old son at home, you know, so that's the main focus. We're having a, an amazing time with him. Now, give us his name. His name is Solomon. And so we call him Solly. Ooh for wisdom i like that that's right and you know so we talked about my book and my family story so he's actually named after my great grandfather uh my, wow. my grandmother's father who who was you know he was killed in the holocaust that's and he's beautiful he was my grandmother's hero you know and, and she still mm -hmm. talks about him a lot and she learned so much from him and i learned so much from her and my son will learn from me you know so it all kind of started with my grandmother's father and so my my son has his name do he look like you dan you know he does. He does. He does look like his dad. Uh, he's cute like his mom, but he looks like his dad somehow. So he has, he has, you know, it works. Good answer, it good works. answer, good answer. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> he's got like, he's got curly red hair. Uh, he's just, he's as cute as can be, man. And he's sweet. And I'll tell you, he's got a, he's got a little basketball hoop, you know, in our little living room area here. And there'll be like, it happened the other day where we were eating dinner, you know, and he's eating his food. And he put his food down. He goes, I'm done. I want to shoot hoops. <laughs> I, I looked at my wife. I said, yep, we're good. We're good. My you know, man. And, 
just like my dad didn't force it on me, I don't force it on him. But hey, there are there's a hoop and there are balls all over the house. If you just if you want to do it, I'm not going to argue. You know? right. But it's built into the DNA. It's built already the there. DNA, it's man. built in. He, he loves it. <laughs> he That's third right. generation, third yep. generation ball <laughs> on the way. It's built in. It's built in. This has been so amazing, man. Thank you so much for your time. Um, the book is called By the Grace of the Game. You can get it at Amazon and other book outlets. Uh, but before we go, my guy AG got an, one last question for you. DG, man, I just want to say thank, man, for coming on the show, man. You, Your, your life story is very inspiring, and your dad's thank is you. too. And that grandmother of yours and your wife and, and your, little, your little Solomon. Thank, we want to thank them for letting you out, have that time with us today, man. But what is the next chapter in Dan Grunfield's hoop dream? That's a, that's a great question. That's a great question. You know, it, it never stops, right? Because, Will, you said you, you're still talking to your sons about basketball. Like, every day I call my dad and we talk about the game, you know? So it, it really never stops in terms of, like, what it's going to look like for me. I mean, listen, this book is a big part of it because it is so much about basketball. So you know, even having conversations like this, you know, to be mm -hmm. able to connect with two people I admire, you know, to hear you, Arthur, tell me that my story is inspiring to hear it from you. It's crazy to me, right? Because I grew up, you know, looking up to both of you, man, and, and, and just seeing, you know, how you two kind of carried yourselves uh, has always inspired me. So I'm just I'm grateful for you both so much. But listen, man, I think that's what's beautiful about all of our hoop dreams. They never stop. Stay up to date on new episodes. And if you missed any, they all can be found on iTunes and Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm the gold of my era. I've been a trending topic. I'm as fly as a feather. My pocket's macroscopic. See, with time, I get better. I'm always in the action, kid. No, I got it locked from Chicago where the toughest live. Concrete jungle, earn my stripes on the pavement there. You make it here, then you can make it anywhere. No comparison. Your game is embarrassing. No one can touch me, I'm all but going there again. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha AG. I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha AG. I'm box office in one day. Hoop Dreams, the podcast, an Unlearning Network production. Written and produced by Arthur Ag, Will Gates, Matt Hoffer, and Chantel Shan. With audio engineering by Matt Savage. For more episodes, check us out at www.unlearningnetwork.com. The money get us. Gotta be a dog to survive in this cold weather. Ice in my veins, no need for a warm sweater. I'm coming for it all, best believe I won't let up, yeah. Hey, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha AG. I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha AG. I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me.